and a very warm welcome to each one of you who have been connected with us through our iTalks webinar. Also, I would like to thank you all for taking the time out from your heavy schedule and marking our program with your glorious presence. Thank you for joining with us this evening. And also don't forget to subscribe our YouTube channel so you can always be in touch with our programs even in the future. For now, I would like to step forward to integrate today's session. And also I would like to notify you all that we will be having our discussion session at the end of the webinar. So if you get any queries in between the session, then just drop it on our comment section. We will get back to you later on. Today, as a speaking delegate, we have a very special guest, Dr. Charles Sidolf Sky, all the way from United States, and he will be talking on topic sports vision. Before we begin, I would like to give a general introduction. Dr. Charles is an OD and a fellow of College of Optometrists in Vision Development. He is also the clinical director for Special Olympics Texas and the founder and director of International Sports Vision Association. I welcome you, Dr. Charles, on behalf of Mirai Foundation and all our participants. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here and thanks everyone for the invitation. I'm really excited about speaking to all of you today about uh, what we do with, um, with Sports Vision. I'm going to switch over to my screen here and we'll get, get things moving forward here. Um, here we go. All right, excellent. So I'm gonna jump over here and we will get this up on the screen. Um, and uh, so we're gonna talk a little, it should be coming up here just a second. There we go. All right. Um, so we really want to talk about the specialty of sports vision. How do you get involved with sports vision? Um, and, and so that's kind of where, where we want to take this conversation today. As, as uh, was mentioned, I, I'm, I'm one of the founding members and, um, and also currently the vice president of the International Sports Vision Association. Uh, this is an open membership. I'll, give, I'll, I'll provide the website at the end. It's sportsvision.pro, though, is the website. We would love for many of you to come join us in our organization. We do an annual meeting every year. Um, I think uh, this coming year will be in February and it'll be in Orlando, Florida, but um, there may be an option to, to do this online as well. So uh, keep an eye out on the website and we can tell you more about it at that point in time. So let's just jump right in here. Um, what's the, our goals? So we're gonna find, identify what sports vision is. Um, about the vision skills for athletes. Um, what vision te what, what vision tests can we use for athletes? And I was just uh, speaking to Capil, and I was saying uh, it's really a sport and position dependent. It's really an important point. You can't really there's really no one way to do sports vision. You got to do it depending on what the athlete sports, what the even in what their position is is really important. Um, what can we do for vision skills enhance, enhancement? What are some of the tools that are out there now to help us out? And let's talk, we'll talk a little bit about concussion and vision rehabilitation after concussion. Concussion has become such an issue in our, in our uh, eye care world now um, because almost 90% of all concussion patients have visual symptoms. So it's really become an important factor. And there's lots of sports where you see concussions um, here in the U.S., but also lots of sports. But from what, what I've come to learn in in, in, your, in Nepal as well, um, are, are put you at risk for concussion. And then we'll talk a little bit about eye protection too. Uh, how do we protect people's eyes when we're doing this this type of work? So, what is sports vision? It's evaluation, treatment, and consultation designed to protect, correct, and enhance vision in order to make sports and athletic competition safer and more successful. And I think that's really an important point there. Obviously, safer is really one, one big key takeaway on it. But really, what the athlete ultimately wants is to be more successful at their sport. Um, so there's really a bunch of different categories that sports vision falls under. You know, uh, there's prevention of sports eye injuries. There's visual skill performance, uh, screening and testing. There's refractive status, uh, ocular health, what we need to do, we need to do an evaluation of that. 
uh, vision skills task analysis, visual skill enhancement, vision rehabilitation for, once again, that's for the concussion patients, and then eye protection and lenses. So here's some facts, and most of this from the US, but, but I think it still kind of carries over in, in importance. More than 600,000 eye injuries related to sports and recreation occur every year. 42,000 of these injuries are of a severity that requires emergency room attention. Many, probably more than the 42,000 are not reported, especially in college and professional sports. And that's a really important factor right there. More than 90% of eye injuries can be prevented with the use of appropriate protective eyewear. So using a half shield visors are a really good step in a lot of the sports or at least full or full shield visors are a really major, major step forward. Um, so what are some of the vision skills we need for the great sports performance? Well, I identified a, a few, quite a few of them right here. The first one is eye tracking. Obviously in sports vision, that becomes really, really important. Um, uh, we have, most of the times we have to track a ball, a, a puck, um, a something along those lines to, uh, to, and we have to track all these things and make sure that uh, we're able to point our eyes in the same place at the same time, follow the object wherever it's going. Um, eye coordination at distance and near. Depth perception, peripheral awareness. Um, that's something I really focus a lot of my early attention on is a lot of peripheral awareness activities. Fixation accuracy. Uh, eye track. Once again, eye tracking is there twice. It's that important. Um, color perception, gross visual motor control, fine visual motor control, sustained focus at distance and near, visual recognition, visual perception, and then localization skills. These are all important skills for the athlete. So the first thing I have to do when I talk to an athlete is I have to determine what's their skill, vision skills task. And we have to look at each athlete individually. Um, so what's the purpose of the skill? Uh, sports skills can have a wide range of purpose. Like in, if you're going to stop a puck or a soccer ball, if you're a goalie, um, uh, be aware of teammates to make an effective pass. So if you're on the soccer pitch and the, you're, you're trying to take a rush up the field, you have to be aware of where the other players are so you can get them the ball. Um, uh, making a move on a player just to keep them off balance, something you might use in, 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 in you know, football or soccer or basketball, some of these different sports. Um, uh, and then even in tennis, obviously, um, tracking becomes very important. There's a great picture of the tennis player here with this focus right on the ball. So it's really important aspect of of that. So we have to look not only at, once again, not only at the individual, but what position they're playing, what's their responsibility to their team. Uh, and that's how you help determine. For instance, a goalie in soccer is going to have a different skill set than, a, than the, uh, a forward or center on, on, on the soccer team. So once again, really important to separate that out. Then we have to look at what's their demands. Okay. So you have static visual demands, that's stationary visual, visual information. So um, if you're gonna, um, uh, things like archery or target shooting, but even taking a penalty kick for a goalie uh, at first is a very st static vision demand. It becomes a, a, a non-static vision demand, but it starts as a static vision demand. Um, so, and obviously the non-static visual demands are moving targets, which is mostly what we use in sports. And sustaining visual demands, how long must you sustain a visual load? How long do you have to stay focused on that ball? Is it a short period? Is it a long period? So when we do therapy, I think there's three major attributes that we have to look at for any therapy. This, this goes whether you're doing regular vision therapy, you're doing sports vision therapy, you're doing uh, rehabilitative therapies. Um, you're, you're looking at latency, velocity, and accuracy. Those are three really important attributes. So latency is the delay. So obviously for most sports, we want less latency, right? We want to, quick, we want to pick up the, the ball quicker. We want to see things faster. So we want to decrease that latency. Velocity, that's the speed. We, need, we want to increase the speed of our system, okay? Uh, we want to be able to stabilize that and, and follow it, track a ball better and be aware of things better and, and, and really use that speed of system much better. And accuracy, how, how on target are we? 
We want to increase their ability to be on target. That's going to score more goals. That's going to allow us to have a, a better outcome to our sports activity. So well, since we're talking to you guys in Nepal, I decided to, you know, what's, what's, what are the important sports in Nepal uh, that we can talk about? And, and, there, and one of the similarities of some of the sports that we see here in the U.S., I mean, cricket obviously kind of has some similarities to baseball here in the U.S. Football um, or soccer, um, obviously we play that here. Uh, we play that all over North America and Canada and, and Mexico, Central America. Um, soccer is a very, very big sport. Um, and then for you guys and, and, and your part of the world, Kabaddi, which I didn't know about until about two, three weeks ago. Uh, an ironic story is uh, when I was called to, to do this lecture, it turns out my son is actually dating a young lady from Nepal. And um, so I, I, I was with them having dinner a few weeks ago. And I said, so tell me what are the big sports in Nepal? Uh, and they should tell me about Kabaddi. And I looked it up and I started watching videos of this sport. Um, I love this. Sport. I would, I would love to play this sport. I, I, I'll be honest with you. It's right up my alley. Um, I played rugby in college. So, you know, th those type of, of sports are, are things that I would really enjoy. But so I really trying to look at and, and try to analyze, even though I've never seen Kabaddi until about two or three weeks ago, I really wanted to understand what is the vision skills needed for it. And, um, and certainly you know, there are some very specific visual skills, peripheral awareness, um, uh, a lot of fixational type activities that were really important for that sport. So that's a new sport to me, but um, I, I enjoyed watching uh, some of the YouTube videos on the sport. Um, but the big three vision skills, and I've alluded to the first one already is eye tracking. To me, it's one of the most important things um, uh, that we have to look at. Obviously binocularity, how's our convergence and divergence system um, is important as well. And then central peripheral processing. We have to be able to pick up things from the periphery and move it to the central very efficiently. Um, and that's really the key when we're doing any type of any of these sports is to improve our efficiency. So when we, go, when we talk about types of testing, um, it depends on the scenario. Like when I work with a team and I work with three professional teams, I work with two professional hockey teams and one uh, professional soccer team. Um, we do a basic sports vision screening at the beginning of the season. So what we'll do is we'll go out to the screening facility and shoot, it could be a, a doctor's office. It could be a, it could be their stadium. Uh, it could be their practice facility, whatever. Um, and we, we can do a screening. And so we'll, we'll do a variety of different tests during a screening. Um, we will usually only given a short amount of time per player, usually 10 or 15 minutes. So we have to be very time efficient and, and the figuring out what's going on with that athlete. And then the comprehensive sports vision analysis um, is when they come to our office. And usually we, we do that, it's usually over an hour. Um, we'll do a variety of different tests. I'm gonna show you some of the tests in a little bit. Um, and, uh, but uh, we will do a variety of testing in the office that will kind of um, uh, allow us to do a really comprehensive evaluation of that uh, individual sports skills. Um, here's some important points on vision testing. It's not only good enough to do the test and get the result, but you have to look at the quality of how they did the test. Um, for instance, is it taking them significant effort or do they do it with easily? What's their posture like? The best example I can give you of this is, is stereo testing, right? If you're doing stereo vision testing, um, uh, I'll go through the stereo book. And if, the, if they go through the stereo book and says, it uh, looks like the first one, it looks like the third one, it looks like the second one, it looks like the third. If they're doing it really slowly and methodically. That worries me for an athlete. I want them to go through second one, third one, first one, second one, first one. I want it to be fast. I call that the speed of stereo. I want them to do it with speed of stereo. So um, we want to see how qual what the quality is like. Um, and so in any test you th you're doing when you're doing it with an athlete, I want you to think about not only what result do I get from a quantitative standpoint, but what is the quality of that result? So, and don't forget with, sp with athletes, average visual measurements are not sufficient because you're trying to create elite visual skills, um, which to leads to superior athletic performance. So just doing, average visual me measurements. If, if you test them and they're just average, 
then there's definitely room for improvement. In fact, the big difference between doing regular vision therapy and doing sports vision therapy is regular vision therapy, you're taking someone with, with subpar skills and taking it to normal. But you're taking a per, an, with an athlete, you're taking someone with, with probably normal skills and making it an elite level. So that's the big difference. You're using the, some of the same techniques, by the way, uh, as you would normally look, use, but you're, you're doing, you're, you're tuning it up. You're, you're loading that, that skill so high that it makes it more and more and more challenging and it challenges that athlete. So visual acuity, let's talk about that. 2020 eyesight alone is not sufficient for optimal athletic performance. We have to think of that visual acuity in really three different components of it. Um, we have to check obviously your distance and at distance and near, but you want to look at it from a static element and a dynamic element. Uh, static meaning you're, you're sitting in there, having you sit in the chair, you're looking at an eye chart, okay? That's static visual acuity. Nobody's moving, but we want to give them the best corrected acuity. 2020 or six over six is not enough. You, you definitely want to, um, uh, you definitely, you, you'd love to make them six, three or six, four um, or six, five off better than six, being six, six, as far as your, your acuity goes. Um, so you, you want to get them to the highest level of acuity possible. The second factor is dynamic visual acuity. The problem with dynamic visual acuity is very, very hard to measure. Okay, so you can use a, a rotating board to measure it. You can use, um, there's some tools like uh, uh, Right Eye has a tool that will look at dynamic visual acuity. Um, but it's availability to maintain visual clarity when the athlete or the object of regard is in motion. And that's just as important. So if they're in motion and the visual acuity drops off to, to six, you know, six ten, or, or or you know six twelve, that could be a problem. Okay, we want to make sure they're maintaining com comfortable visual acuity even under motion. Contrast sensitivity. Um, it's important for some sports. Um, some sports more than others. Obviously, a, a sport like skiing, as I pictured above. Um, you, you can see where if you're on a hazy day or it's snowing out, um, so, uh, the haze can be a problem. Uh, in hockey, it might be uh, considering, I, I have sometimes I'll do for training, I'll have them use a white puck instead of a black puck because they're on ice and it's harder to see it. So they'll pick up the contrast on it. This bottom picture is a picture I took um, last year. I was in Toronto, Canada um, to teach a course there. And uh, I got invited out to the uh, soccer game um and right after uh, the, the halftime was over they blew some fireworks off so the first part of the third uh, of the of the uh, second half of the game um that's what the field looked like uh, me just taking it with my iphone um you could see a lot of haze on the field so the athletes had to work through that haze at least on half the field it was there um We've got to look at color perception. It's not as, as critical as other things. And certainly color deficient people can be very successful at sports, but you still, but if you're trying to identify colors of different objects, I think color perception can be something that needs to be taken a look at. Obviously refractive status. Once again, we want to give them the best possible vision. And you can use a tool like Welsh Allen makes that nice little spot tool, which is great. Um, uh, you know, obviously your, your subjective, your retinoscopy, those are all important aspects of uh, refractive status. Then we wanna look at eye movements. And as I said, one of the big skills. So we, we kind of break the eye movements down into three categories, pursuits, which is the smooth continuous movements. Uh, I, I like to do this slowly. I don't do this fast at first. Sl slower eye movements when you do pursuits, it's gonna un uncover more, more issues. So I'll start off very, very slow. For saccades, we're going to talk about ballistic movements. We want to do them fast, uh, related to peripheral uh, visual attention and peripheral vision. If they don't have good peripheral vision or visual attention, they're not going to know where in space to move their eyes. So that's going to cause them to undershoot or overshoot the targets. Uh, and in sports, that can be very detrimental to the, to the outcome. So these, these, you want to make these quick ballistic movements very, very efficient. And after, at, at the end of each saccade, when you make a saccade, you make that jump. And then after the saccade, you make a fixation. And are you able to lock down the fixation? Are you able to maintain fixation long enough to access the situation and act on it? So that's what a fixation is all about. 
So for, for eye movements, it's important to evaluate the range of movement. Can, can they make a full excursion with their eye movements? Uh, how about under motion when they're moving? Can they make a full range of eye movements? What's the ease and comfort of the movement? Obviously, you're going to look for some restrictions and nystagmus, especially in end gaze. Um, are you, what's the quality and ability to sustain the eye movements? So uh, how is their eye movements compare early in the competition to the latter part of the competition? You know, if they're, when they get tired and fatigued, how is that going to affect them? Um, so those are some of the things to think about. So when I look at eye movements, I will look at it in a variety of different ways. I will look at it um, from in a seated, seated position in our exam room chair, but then I'll put them in their athletic stance, or I might put them into a heel to toe on, on the floor. I'll have them heel, heel to toe, and I'll have them do the eye movements that way. And they should be able to quickly and accurately locate landmarks and follow an object of regard. So that's what we're trying to get them to do. Follow a puck on ice, follow a soccer ball across the room, follow a tennis ball. All those are important aspects of what we try to do. Um, we also want to look at their ability to go distance near. Obviously, when balls are coming closer and further, we have to use our accommodative system. And so we have to look at the quickness of an accommodative system. We have to look at the strength of the system. Um, we can do different tools to do that. There's something called the synaptic sensory station where you can use. They have a near far thing. Um, we can use a saccadic fixator and do distance near activities. Uh, we can just do set up two heart charts, one, one far and one near and, and test that way as well. And then binocularity. Um, obviously when I do a cover test, I like to do different positions of gaze. Okay. Um, so that's an important thing to do. So when I do different positions of gaze, I want them straight ahead, but I want them looking down or looking up or looking to the right and looking to the left. Don't forget, athletes don't keep their eyes straight all the time. Okay, so we have to look at them in, in all nine uh, cardinal points of gaze so we can make sure the binocularity is the same in every, every position. Uh, for forays, we want to do eye position at rest. Um, you want to do a, a distance for you, a near for you, vertical for you to kind of see how the forays are. You can do a Brock string or string with beads and do it stationary. You can do it moving. You actually move the Brock string uh, up and down and side to side and have them do the Brock string and maintain that binocularity. Um, so that is a, another, another nice tool that we have in our toolbox. Depth perception of stereopsis. Now here comes the big question on this. Most depth perception tests are done at near, but for sports, the near depth perception is not quite as important as distance depth perception. So there are a couple of good tools out there that you can do for distance depth perception. Uh, Brunel makes a nice distance depth perception chart. I'm sure you have some local people that, that will make some distance depth perception tools as well. Um, so I like to test depth perception at, tw at 20 feet or 10 feet. Um, usually at 10 feet is what I'm doing, um, just to see how they're doing uh, from uh, at that distance also. There's also some other tools that will do depth perception testing. Synaptic Sensory Station, again, has a depth perception test. Uh, Brunel Distance Stereo, uh, m and is, is, is that eye chart there at the bottom that's available. Um, and they have a sports vision performance um, thing. But they also, even in their general uh, regular eye chart, they have um, uh, depth, distance depth perception. Uh, Binobi Touch um, uh, is what used to be called the Wayne Saccadic Fixator. And uh, it's a touch, pad, touch board, and they have some new activities on their iPad that look at depth perception. And you can do it at a variety of different distances. So that's really nice. Some vision adaptation activities you can do. Um, a lot of times I'll just have, I'll put on yoke prisms, like 15 or 10 prism doctors, base right, base left, base up, base down. I'll do a beanbag toss into a bucket and see how quickly they can adapt to that spatial change. So if I put a um, a 15 prism doctor base up and then I have them toss bean bags into a bucket. Um, how is that, how, do they overshoot it? Do they undershoot it? How quickly are they able to make that adaptation and that change? So here's an example of us working with a baseball player right here. E-Y-B-A-K-O. So we're up reading a heart chart. Good. He's having to turn around real quick and make a vision adaptation and catch them. Good try. That was really, really good. What we're using is we're using different color bean bags. So there's certain bean bags he'll catch underhand, certain bean bags he'll catch overhand, and certain bean bags he has to miss. 
I see the red one, yeah, I missed that. So that's not how to do that. So that, that is just an example of a, uh, a beanbag hatch that we'll use for, for sports vision. And we can have them see how they can adapt to their, their changing environment. Uh, and then there's eye hand and eye hand foot coordination. Um, Binovi, as I mentioned, is the updated Wayne Saccata fixator. Uh, it looks like that board there at the bottom right. Ability to interpret visual input and successfully coordinate hand, eye, and foot associated. Now you might be thinking, how do you handle, how do you do it? The feet. Well, they're coming out with a balance board um, anytime now. We're supposed to be out by now, but of course, uh, this COVID thing has gotten in the way of them getting stuff shipped. But probably very soon, we'll have, they'll have the ability to do balance um, and feet coordination with Binobi. But there's also a product called Fit Lights that are out there, which are lights. These lights you can put on, you can put them on the ground, you can put them on the wall, and they have to swing by the, the fit lights when they when they light up, and they're pretty good. You can also use tennis balls, and you can use tennis balls with different colors. So kind of like what we were doing with the bean bags, you might have a red ball that they'll miss, but you'll have a yellow ball to catch overhand, and a and a and a let's say a green ball to catch underhand. Um, so you can do a good go no go activity with the tennis ball. You can also mix in. Um, uh, you can also mix in a, uh, um, uh, things like um, uh, strobe glasses um, or use, using strobes. So we, we use the strobe glasses that's made by Synaptic and they flash uh, and they can, you can change the speed of the flash. And by doing that, we can actually um, so we can make that tennis ball toss even harder when they do something like the Synaptic uh, goggles. We can look at dominance, uh, eye, hand, eye, foot, and ear dominance. Uh, obviously, visual dominance is the one we're most concerned with. Are they right eye dominant or are they left eye dominant? If they're a cricket player, for instance, and they're up to bat, you know, if they're uh, if they're right-handed, if you think about they're right-handed, okay. Um, if they're left eye dominant, that, that puts them at an advantage. They can they can keep their they can close up their stance a little bit. But if they're right eye dominant, they have to open up and face the bowler. Uh, uh, more effectively. So um, I think that's that's something you have to look at is you have, that will help you position the athlete for, for greater success. I'm a big advocate of balance testing. I test almost all of my patients for balance and it's really not too hard to do. So what I'll do is um, uh, we, because athletes have to make motor movements off balance, we have to kind of challenge the balance system. And I'll use this little pad here on the right called an Airx pad. Um, uh, you can buy them on Amazon and what have you, whatever's available to you guys there. Um, it's just a simple foam mat of memory, memory foam. And, um, and, and it helps us help, we use it to help identify where the body is in space, um, despite the dynamic fa factors. And particularly when you have a post-concussion patient, this is really, really important testing to do, but I test pretty much all my athletes for balance. And if you want to get fancy, we have computerized balance testing. So we have a platform like this in our office. Um, and this platform uh, that you see, you will have the, pa the patient stand up on the platform, put their hands on their hips. We'll test them first with their eyes open, then with their eyes closed. Then we'll put them on the that AirX pad that you saw on the phone, on top of the foam mat, and we'll have them do eyes open and eyes closed. And what it's going to measure, it's going to measure center of balance, and it's going to measure sway. And we can actually get a, a, a computerized printout of their balance system. So that when we do the platform a posturography, uh, we use a technique called the modified CATSIB or the modified clinical test of sensory interaction on balance. And so what we're doing is when we're on the firm board with the eyes open, we're testing how the senses integrate with each other. Um, so it's looking at vision, it's using our proprioception, and it's looking at vestibular, because those are the three basic inputs to balance. When we're on the eyes closed on the firm surface, we're primarily using proprioceptive input. Okay, that, so that's what's the input from our feet telling us. When their eyes are open on the, on the foam mat or, or an unstable surface, we're primarily using visual input. And when our eyes are closed on an unstable surface on the foam, we're primarily using vestibular input. 
So we're going to see if there's a balance problem, but we're also going to see how, ba how balance is affected under those circumstances. It's going to isolate those three com major components to balance. An important thing, thing to think about, if you don't even have a balance tester, if you just have that pad, how do you do it? Well, you have to use good observational skills. So you can put them on just the floor, um, hands on the hips, having look straight ac across the room with their eyes open and you look at their balance. And then, then you have to close their, then you have them close their eyes and see how their balance changes. Then you have one of those foam mats. You put it on the floor, you have them step on the foam mat. The good thing about memory foam is if they're leaning back on their heels, for instance, they're gonna put a bigger imprint on the heels. If they're leaning toward their toes, you're gonna see a bigger imprint on the toes. So you have them sit on, stand on the mat for 20 seconds or so, uh, watch their balance, see how their sway is. Um, and make an observation about it. Then you have them step off, and you can see if um, uh, you can see if where, where the imprint is heaviest. Is it imprint heaviest to the heels or the toes? And you can get an idea of center of balance. Then you do it with the eyes closed, okay, and see where their balance is, and um, and and do, and just see where the imprint is, and see how much more uh, imbalance they have relative to the vision. So obviously, if you were going to look at a graph of how this would look. The firm would have the least movement uh, with the eyes open, then eyes closed would have the second most amount of uh, least amount of movement. Then on the when you go on the foam mat, the eyes open on the unstable surface would, would be next, and then eyes closed on the unstable surface would have the most expected movement. So that would be your expectations in doing that activity. We can nowadays we also have something called electronic eye tracking. There's a tool called right eye out there. Um, it's, uh, it's this little computer screen. Um, and what you'll see at the very bottom of the screen here is a little um, uh, eye tracker. And what, what's really nice about having that eye tracker is that you can have a dot going across the screen and it's tracking your eye movements. You have a, track, a dot moving up and down, how we track eye movements. We, have, we do it in circles. We do jumps between two points for saccades. Uh, and so it's a really nice little test that we have available to us um, to, to be able to look at eye movements much more efficiently and have an objective measurement of those eye movements. But once again, you can easily do it in the exam room just by having them follow a wand um, and then do, doing saccades and do, looking at fixations. But it's always nice to have some of these tools that, that are out there and available to us. Um, and the right eye will do a complete sports vision analysis. So this is the, the right eye sports vision analysis. So we can actually go in and we can look at uh, the top part of the pyramid there is on field, um, you know, and then we, we can look at mind eye and we can look at mechanics, which is the third level and functional. Um, and we can see how that, that athlete scores and it, each is rated as a gold medal, a silver medal or a bronze medal. So obviously if they can get a gold medal, that's good. If they have a silver medal, that means maybe they can use a little work in that area. If they have a bronze medal, yeah, that's an area we definitely want to work on. So, um, so we can, and then they get an overall medal at the very top with their final score. So that's a nice little way we can demonstrate to the athletes. So remember we, I mentioned earlier when we do vision screenings uh, for these athletes and we have 10 or 15 minutes, a lot of times this is the test I'll bring with me. I'll, I'll take one or two of these and I'll run this. And it makes it um, really, really nice to be able to, um, uh, to, to get, get some really good measurements and efficient measurements for, for, for our individual uh, patients there. Um, so let's see here. So, uh, this, this right here is um, this, the, the uh, Synaptic Sensory Station. This was originally developed by Nike uh, about 15 years ago. And then since then, what's happened is um, uh, they, they've really evolved, uh, evolved it. And so there's a, as you notice a, at the top of it, there's a small tablet and then there's a big screen. So you can do seven of the 10 tests right on the tablet. And you can see, I did a screening for professional golfers. Uh, you see the young lady at the bottom and she, we just used the tablet there because we did seven of the tests. And that's the vision clarity, which is acuity, contrast sensitivity, depth perception, near far quickness, perception span, multiple object tracking and reaction time. And then we had the big screen and we added, we can add in target capture, um, how quickly you can capture a target eye hand coordination and we can also do a go no go activity with it so that that's the sensor synaptic sensory station very very nice tool to have um this is a a, a before and after of a young 
a hockey player I worked with uh, about two years ago. Um, and you, so the original, um, the, the original area on the inside in the white was his original test, okay, that he did. Um, and you can see he did good in some areas, but weaker in a lot of other areas. And then after we did therapy, we repeated the test. So that area in the light blue is his, how his vision skills improved, particularly in the, those areas on the left-hand side, eye-hand coordination, target capture, and reaction time improved dramatically, as did uh, near-far quickness. So those are a lot of the skills that he improved as he did therapy with us, so we can do a before and after measurement of that. So when we do vision training for, for sports, um, you know, obviously we're, we're looking at um, what, what is the goal of training? We want to transform the good athlete to an elite athlete, which I mentioned before. Very, very important point. We want to minimize the risk of injury. There was a study that came out of University of Cincinnati about six or seven years ago now, where they looked at the college football team. And that is an important point. And they found out that those who did sports vision therapy in the off season actually had a much lower rate of concussions than those who did not participate in the off season vision therapy program. So what that tells you, if you can pick up things quicker, you can, you can minimize the risk of injury too. So that's why it becomes even more important to, to work with our athletes in the off season to, to be able to minimize that injury risk. Where can we do training? Sometimes we can do it in the office. That's the easiest place to do it. But sometimes you have to go to the team's, team's training facility or you can, or like during COVID, we have to do it at home. So we have to give them activities to work on at home. So th those are some of the different things that we need to uh, be able to be flexible with as far as that goes. Um, so I, I actually borrowed this from a, a different group, but it's really kind of a nice little diagram of, uh, called, we call it the sports vision pyramid. And at the bottom of the pyramid is visual acuity and contrast sensitivity. Uh, so it's monocular sensory process. So it's the lowest level. Then you wanna work on stereo vision and depth perception, which is your binocular sensory processes. So th this is kind of how you build a program, a, a therapy treatment program as you start you start with the visual acuity and contrast. Um, you go to stereo vision, visual decision making, which is your neural processing, your visual mechanics, which is your visual integration, and then converting it all to on field. If I had to add one level to this pyramid, and and uh, and I'm going to tell you what it is right now. Right below visual acuity contrast is vision and balance, um, visual peripheral awareness, things like that. I think that really. Is, is, are things that really are more on, on the foundation um, than actually visual acuity and contrast. So I, I typically, when I do a therapy program, I start a vision vestibular integration or what I call um, visual vestibular uh, grounding before I work on anything else. Um, so, but I think this is a pretty good picture of what you're trying to accomplish in, in treating for sports vision. There's a, another tool out there called multiple object tracking that you can do. Uh, this is a tool called Neuro Tracker that we have available to us. So what you'll see is four highlighted balls, uh, and then the, the lighting will the, the lighting of the on the balls will go away, um, and then they'll start to circulate. And as they start circulating, then you have to track the four balls that were highlighted, and then the numbers will come up at the end and then you have to pick out which ones you saw. Okay, so that's kind of the neuro tracker. So it's a really pretty cool tool that's out there. So here is that same baseball player we were showing you earlier. He's doing um, the neuro tracker, but he's also on a balance board balancing himself at the same time. Um, so there's an interesting, interesting story behind this baseball player. Um, that I'm going to share with you guys, um, and I'll, I'll try. To, I, I have the link right up there on the screen, um, uh, and maybe we'll come back to it at the end if we have a little time. But um, there, there's a big sports. I'm sure you have Sports Illustrated there that comes from the U.S. But if you don't, uh, it's a it's a huge magazine with international circulation. Um, so he was a, a, a college baseball player, and he started suffering symptoms of what they call visual snow syndrome. Uh, which basically means he was seeing static. So obviously as a baseball player, it was affecting him dramatically. Um, 
And so he actually had to take off a season and a half of baseball season because he couldn't function. He was pretty non-functional. He was struggling in school. Um, and uh, he, he basically had to give up his dream. And um, uh, so what ended up happening, he went to consult the doctors all over the U.S. and no one gave him any hope. And then it turns out he, he, he lived about five minutes away from my office and someone gave his mother my name and they came in and I worked with him uh, over last summer and uh, got him back to, to have 100% improvement in his symptoms. Um, in other words, he had no symptoms when we were done. And he was able to go back to baseball and he led the league in hitting this year. So that was really exciting for us to see. Um, and so, um, so what ended up happening at, well, during this whole COVID thing, um, uh, the, the conference that he played in, in for baseball did an article about him and it was picked up all over the country and it ultimately was picked up in Sports Illustrated. And they did a nice little article about him uh, uh, and obviously mentioning our office. And now it's led it into a thing that we're going to start doing a study now on visual snow um, and, had, and treatment of visual snow. And that's going to be a two center study to start with. So I'm really excited to be participating in that. Um, I mentioned the sensory station before. This kind of gives you a little bit better look at it. That's what it looks like. Um, the strobes we talked about also. Strobes are really cool. Um, uh, we, there's also a thing called synchrony that we can use, which uh, we have in our office also, which is just a, um, uh, it's a lighted up um, cord and the, the lights come toward you and it's an anticipation timer and anticipate when you, when you, when the light comes towards you. Um, so that's a nice thing for ball sports, particularly. Um, uh, so you, you anticipate that when that ball is going to be come to, toward you really good for tennis, uh, baseball, cricket, things of that nature. This is what the strobe looks like. Um, so you kind of see what the strobe looks like here. It's all operated via your cell phone. Uh, there's an app on your cell phone and it, you control the speed, you control which eye blinks, you control, now they even have it blink, where it will blink in sectors. So the upper part will blink, the lower part will blink, the right side will blink, the left side will blink, the upper right will blink. You can set it up any way you want. So that's really a cool thing that's, uh, that's available to us in the strobe. Uh, I wear. So here's us two directly. Yeah, the two different like companies that uh, like that. we're going to show you is us working um, with ball catching with with strobes on uh, at a sports facility that we work with. Um, so you kind of see us working with a uh, um, with this this player here, and you see this is a really good athlete, but with the strobes on, he's having to make really tough judgments, and it makes catching the ball, especially under movement much harder. We did this picture in nice, nice slow motion so you can kind of see how, uh, how it affected him. Um, so that, that's on a little indoor sports field that's not far from us. Um, so we can work on things like that. Once again, I showed you the Binobi earlier. That's the Binobi Touch. It, uh, once again, the remade um, type of... The cool thing about the Binobi Touch now is you can connect up to eight of these things together, which is great. Um, so you can really work across the room with it and really challenge a person. There's a picture uh, here. This next one is a one, uh, we set up two Binobi touches in the Dallas Stars, which is the professional hockey team here in Dallas. Um, they're, uh, they're, we, we set up this little um, Binobi touch here. Uh, we set up two stations so we can actually work across two different no, um, Binobi touches simultaneously. Get so we were just... Start demonstrating it is good to probably extend the time just a smidge um, how to do uh, this between two this board activity uh, later on we put them on like sl a sliding ice type thing and so they kind of slide side to side oh, yeah. as they did so oh, okay. that gives you cut kind of an idea of what you can do with the static fixators when you have more than one really makes it nice and here's myself with five of them uh and I, I had the opportunity to go up to Canada to, to Binobi's headquarters and, and play with five of them simultaneously, which was really a challenge, I have to admit it. By the way, it was cold there that day. So I'm wearing a pretty heavy shirt. <laughs> um, this is the fit lights um, or the reaction lights. And you can kind of see how that, these look. You can put them on a bar setting like this. You can put them on a magnetic board. You can put them on the floor. You can put them on different parts of the room, but these little lights will go off and you can kind of hit these lights as you go through them. 
And then you can do mixing and match activities. Um, so you can do multiple object tracking and you can do reaction lights together. So they'll have to do, um, you know, uh, I'll see if this video comes up. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, but I'll give it a shot here. So anyway, let me get out of that real quick and we'll go back to the presentation here. Um, hang on one second. Um, so anyway, let's talk, there's some other activities. Uh, there's a, a new product out called Hico Sticks, which is wonderful. And Hico Sticks are these three, three prong sticks. I think I have a picture of that coming up. Um, there's something called Howl Balls, which is a like three wiffle balls on a on a round um, cord, and uh, the different colors you can toss them, and you can have them catch a specific color. Um, there's McDonald charts. There's accommodative flippers. There's loose lenses. Loose prism walks. Marsden ball. Still a great activity to use is the ball on the string and hanging from the ceiling and moving the ball side to side. Visual tracing. Some red green activities. A pegboard rotator can be very effective. Um, rock string, lifesaver cars, doing things like pointer in the straw. Those are all skills um, that can be very, very helpful. So here's the, the next picture. I, I told you, I promised you that I would show you the Hico sticks. They're a lot of fun also. Um, they're relatively new. They've been out about a year and a half now. Um, and you can buy them online. Uh, go to, just go to Hico, look up Hico sticks and you can find it. But here, oop, let me go back here real quick. But you can see he's right here. He's kind of holding that Hico stick. Um, and as you'll see it's a three prong stick there. I thought I had that as a video, but I guess it didn't come out as a video. So, um, so now the last part, we're gonna talk a little bit about concussions. Um, and concussions, if you're doing sports, concussions are gonna happen. Uh, that's just the nature of it. And so I think it's really important to understand that um, no matter what sport they do, whether it's swimming, whether it's soccer, whether it's uh, kabaddi, um, it's cricket, the risk of concussion is there. Basketball, it's always there. Um, so I, and instead of really kind of going into all the different elements of it, I'm going to show you a, a case that I saw a couple of years back. He was a 26-year-old professional hockey player. He had a concussion 10 days prior. He was referred to me by the neuropsychologist. They were getting ready to release him back to play. Uh, he had cleared their protocol, but he said, you know, he called me up and he said, you know, something weird is going on with his eye movement. So will you take a look at him? Uh, he was a contact lens wearer, minus 275, history of asthma. He was showing a 6 exo at near ortho at distance, but he converged to his nose with effort. Um, his fields were good, but we noticed his eye movements were very jerky. So I agreed with the neuropsychologist assessment there that we needed to look at something like that. So we brought him in and did a right eye and a posturography. So um, what you're gonna see here, the right eye on the left is, um, is we, we, we had the nice capability is that before the season, we were actually able to go in and do a right eye. So we did a preseason screening on him and we saw he had pretty good vision skills overall. Um, and, uh, if anything was a little weak, the saccades were a tad weak, but other than that, he did a, he did pretty good, particularly the vertical saccades were a tad on the weak side. Um, and you'll notice they give you a grade of a green, a yellow or a red green means you did well on the skill. Yellow means it might need a little work and red means it needs, needs significant work. Um, and then right after his concussion, we did the one we, we is the one on the right side. And look at the circular pursuits just right here in the upper left hand corner. You see the circles, how much different they look after the concussion than it does um, before he had the concussion. And you can see his fixations are a little bit off, relatively speaking. Um, and once again, pursuits were off a little 
look at the difference in the horizontal pursuits down here in the and the saccades. So definitely his eye movements were significantly affected by his concussion. Uh, we did some balance testing, and this is that balance test I was showing you before. Um, and so the top line over there is his baseline numbers. Um, we didn't get to, we didn't test that preseason for them, but uh, that was his baseline numbers with the concussion. Um, then we tried some different lenses on him to see if a, a therapeutic lens might be like a yoke prism might be helpful for him, which it wasn't. Um, and it, it wasn't really in a big way, a little bit, but but certainly not in a huge way. Um, and then at four, after four vision training sessions, you can see how much improvement he had in his skills. You can you can see that his circular pursuits were much much improved. Um, his if you kind of go back here real quick, you'll see that you, you're given a number rating on the on the um, on this bar graph at the top, and you can see a, a, the upper left hand bar rating. You see um, he was about an 82 on his preseason screening. After the concussion, he dropped down to about a 50, what is that, a 54, it looked, or 53, it looks like. And then we'll move it back over here to a four, after four sessions of vision therapy, he was already back at a uh, 62 and kind of in the functional range again, which is great. That was just after four sessions of therapy, which is pretty remarkable. And, and then also on the right-hand side, you look at his balance testing where he was all below normal on, on the very first one on his balance testing after four sessions. Look at all these numbers. You wanna see a decrease in the numbers um, that tells us his balance is better. And you can see the norm, norm percentiles uh, when we initially test him was 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, and 10%. After, after therapy, he was uh, 60%, 28%, 49%, and 55%. So much, much improved just with four sessions of therapy. Then we saw him at the end of therapy, and he went, he was above the functional range. He was actually even above his baseline score, uh, scored an 88. And you can see all his eye movements were really, really good at that point. Um, so that's kind of what how you can track things with some of these objective tests, which are really nice to have. But anyway, this is a big problem here. Um, concussion, brain injury, big problem. 1.7 million people with sustained brain injuries annually. There's no estimate for the people with non-fatal TBI seen outside of the emergency room. Many times it's this group who suffers the most, the people that are not diagnosed. Um, so that's an important thing to do. The Journal of the American Medical Association came out with an article about a year ago, it was last summer. They took 1,453 participants at 11, 11 of the uh, tra level one trauma centers uh, here in the US. At 12 months post concussion, the percentage of concussion participants reporting functional limitations was 53%. That means a concussion doesn't go away in two weeks like we were told. Or you, it doesn't mean you, you say you, you're on the field and you say suck it up and, and go back in and play. 53% actually showed symptoms a year after their concussion. That is very telling. So most patients presenting here at concussion at level one trauma centers uh, they're going to have one year post injury issues. Um, and what happens is, though, they deal with it because it becomes the new normal for them. Um, and when it becomes the new normal, then they don't, they just get used to living that way, but they don't have to live that way. We can really help these folks. There are about six uh, trajectories in concussion. Um, at the, uh, obviously, ocular is very important. Um, a loss of cognitive skills becomes very important as well. Uh, Post-traumatic migraines or headaches after concussion are very common. Cervical injuries and cervical type of symptoms can be issues. Uh, change in mood and anxiety. Oftentimes they become very anxious. Um, oftentimes they can become uh, very emotional also. And obviously vestibular is also a major issue with concussion. How common are vision problems after mild traumatic brain injury? Depending on what you read, 50 to 90% of all individuals demonstrate visual dysfunction. My experience shows more like 80 or 90% um, is, is very, very common. What are the prevalence of vision problems after brain injury? Um, this comes from a study. Um, it could really affect any part of the visual process, but some of the com more common things we hear about are blurred vision, double vision or diplopia, headaches, visual field defects, 
and even cranial nerve palsies for severe injuries. Specifically to ocular motor issues following a traumatic injury, um, convergence insufficiency is seen in 55% of mild traumatic brain injuries or concussions, where only they're seen in 5% of the controlled patients. Psychotic impairments are seen in about 30%, where 0% in controls. Pursuit impairment is seen in 60%, 0% of the controls. Ocular misalignment with ver vertical misalignments, 55%. In traumatic brain uh, in, uh, in concussion, 5% in the general population. Horizontal misalignments, 45% in traumatic brain injury, 5% in controls. And accommodative dysfunctions, 65% uh, after concussion, 15% in the controls. So, very, very important factors here that we see. Obviously, see these are major visual issues that you're going to see after a concussion. So common symptoms we might see is balance difficulties, dizziness and vertigo, intolerance for movement. They, they become very sensitive to motion uh, and particularly peripheral motion. Um, decreased attention and mental focus, slow visual motor performance, memory problems, sleep disturbances, and mental and physical fatigue. And obviously the things we look for are, you know, binocular dysfunctions, particularly exotropias or high exophorias. Obviously, the sensory and motor deficits are also important. Now, why is motor important? Because the vision guides motor. Okay, that's an important thing to always remember. No matter what we're talking about, vision guides motor. Um, and so, if, if our vision system is, is is operating at a lower level, the motor system is going to operate at a lower level. <coughs> Here's the hard part. As I said, people that go live in their new normal. Um, they can be tricky to diagnose because they're, they're, they're saying things like, ah, I just don't like to go to the mall or the grocery store anymore. I, I get frequent headaches. I'm bumping into objects more. I'm nervous walking downstairs. I feel like I'm falling at times. I don't feel like myself. I don't like going out and doing the things I normally do. Those are the type of things that we hear and that no one's making an association with the visual issue that we have. Um, Something within uh, the, the TBI world, the brain injury world, we, we call post-trauma vision syndrome. And there are certain characteristics to it um, that are common. And one is exotropia or high exophoria, accommodative issues, um, convergence insufficiency, a lower blink rate, a spatial distortion, poor fixations and pursuits, and just an unstable ambient or peripheral visual process. So sometimes they'll report to us things like diplopia or objects appearing to move on the page or objects in the periphery appearing to move, poor concentration and attention, a staring behavior, uh, poor uh, visual memory, uh, photophobia or light sensitivity. And that's a big one with some of these cases, really photophobic. It's, uh, using tints become very important in many of these cases. Asthenopic symptoms, eye strain, eye fatigue, headaches, and then neuromuscular difficulties, such as balance, coordination, and posture. Once again, that's why balance testing becomes very important with our concussion patients. Um, and really what happens in my estimation with a lot of these patients is when you get visually stressed and all these things cause visual stress, you get what we call an over-focalization or a focal binding that occurs. You become locked down focally and you don't pay attention to your, your peripheral system at all. So you can't uh, release the detail of what you're looking at because even the periphery collapses to the central. And the environment becomes overstimulating. And movement, if you go into a busy, crowded environment, such as the mall or the supermarket, it becomes chaos to that visual system. And then the print on the page becomes just a massive detail. And then, so this is kind of a, a little um, vi video I've had, I've used for years, but it's just really kind of explains to you. The first one is really um, a normal visual system moving across a page. So you'll see that kind of uh, ease, ease of motion right across the page there. Um, then when you have a collapsed visual attention, it kind of looks like this. Um, you'll see that it moves much more slowly. You're not able to go word to word. You're going part of a word, part of a word. So you're really not getting a good look at the, uh, at the whole visual picture. And so it's harder to track that way because you don't know where in space to move your eyes to. And that's parcel in part what happens with our athletes who have had concussions. But we'll also see it in things like autism, 
and attention deficit disorders and things like that. Anything that causes visual stress on the system, this is gonna be the natural response to stress. So I mentioned the grocery store going to the mall, but here's a nice little picture that kind of shows you how, how the, the, the store, grocery store may feel to them uh, when they're going through that store. It just becomes overwhelming to, to a person. Uh, um, so I think that's really a, an important point. So when we go into treatment, I think we have to realize we, we got to go get away from the myths and legends, things that we learned a long time ago, and really based it on neuroscience. And uh, neuroscience is really what's gonna tell us the best treatments for it. All these techniques, all the things we've talked about today is really based on neuroscience, not on uh, you know, uh, just mechanical uh, activity. So when we do vision rehabilitation, I think there's really, th I call it the three R's of, of vision rehabilitation. One is called rewiring, one is re-education, and one is retention. And really what we're ultimately trying to do is enhance connections between the eyes and the brain by building more efficient and connected neural pathways. So those are the three things we always, no matter what type of vision therapy or vision training we're doing, we have to think about those three elements. And that's really what we're trying to accomplish. And the way we can do this is by utilizing a system that's built into our system called neuroplasticity. And it's a process by which the central nervous system can experience repair after an injury. Um, and and we'll, we're going we're gonna to use the neural pathways that are working and we're not use the neural pathways that are not working. Uh, and it, don't forget, we're wired to, 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 to compensate. So if we have a system that's not working, we, comp we figure a way to compensate. But the, not, the compensation is not necessarily a good thing. It's just a way we can get by. So what it ultimately comes down to is we as optometrists, we will make a big difference for the, to improve these patients' lives. Quality of life is really the key thing that we can change. So what are the things we're trying to improve here? Visual function. We want to improve the oculomotor or combination of binocularity skills. Motor function. Attention, especially visual attention. Central peripheral integration. Ability to filter and integrate multiple stimulus. And patient intention and goals. Now, many of these concussion patients that are athletes that I see, I may start them out doing concussion protocol and working with them through the concussion. And as they get better, I'll start mixing in some sports vision activities to really enhance their skills, to get their skills to enhance. That'll give you a case like that, that, that uh, hockey player I saw where they actually ended up with better vision skills than where they started. So we will always do a finish that will, that will help them with their sport. So some potential therapy interventions we'll use is passive therapy. So that's where we can use lenses, prisms, tints, occlusions, therapeutic prisms. And then we can use active therapies, which is neurovision rehabilitation or vision, uh, vision therapy um, to help them enhance their skills. So we really have those two basic courses of action. So when I use lenses, this is a great diagram put together by Deborah Zielinski, who's an optometrist in Chicago. Um, so if you look at the top of the, um, of the, of the uh, cone there, it says, what is it? That's our environment. And we treat that person with lenses, either they're spheres or cylinders. And it's primarily working on the central visual system and our parvocellular system. Uh, then, then if you look at prisms, we have non-yoked or what we call orthoptic prisms, which tells us where something is in the environment. That helps us maintain good binocular vision. Um, it's gonna primarily work on the magnocellular system. And then we have yoke prisms, which are like, three base down both eyes, three base up both eyes, three base right, three base left. Um, and yoke prisms really work on our, uh, where am I? How, where's our body in space? Because it's, that's a one lens that will all alter our center of balance. Um, and then lastly, we have filters. We can use a different occlusions or different tints to change the filter and tells us how I am. And it works primarily on the conio cellular system. So basically active therapy, vision rehab, enhances accommodation convergence skills, anti-suppression, smooth and more accurate eye movements, and peripheral vision enhancement. Uh, we must change our paradigm for treating vision issues related to concussion because traditional treatment for many of us in multiple fields, whether it's physical, physiotherapy or physical therapy, occupational therapy, it's basically, let's do pencil push-ups and a brock string and we'll fix this. And that's really way, way off. We, we can't, it's really for later in the process. So I developed this treatment nomogram a few years back, and it's kind of like the pyramid I showed you earlier for sports vision, but this goes for anything. Um, so this, this should be the model of how we do vision therapy, no matter what we're doing. 
And at the base of the, of the pyramid is motor skills, vestibular peripheral awareness. That's where we need to start our therapy programs. Then we're gonna do central vision and alignment. That's getting eye alignment, near equal acuity, active patching by nasals. Then we're gonna work on vision skills. That's acuity, pursuits, saccades, accommodation, central peripheral fixation, your multiple MFBF activities and your, and your fusional degrees. Free space fusion, vergences. This is where you bring in your Brock string. This is where you bring in your, your pencil push-ups. But you see it's third level. So if you don't, it's kind of like building a house. You're gonna build, a, the first thing you're gonna do when you build a house is to build a good foundation. And then you're gonna build, then you put up scaffolding. Then you're gonna build the house. Then you're gonna take down the scaffolding. So if you build the house on a crumbling foundation, what's gonna happen? The whole house will crumble. So that's why you always have to start at the bottom of, of the pyramid and build it up that way. Um, obviously, when do you begin neurovision rehabilitation? I always say as soon as possible. <laughs> to me, uh, the more I wait, I'm, I'm not going to learn anything by waiting. I'm, I want to get them going. So any type of uh, things that you see that are creating a problem, we're going to start vision rehabilitation. So the big question is, why are we not looking at vision after issues after concussion? We really need to be looking at it. If it's, if it's you know, 80, 90 percent of all our patients, all our concussion patients that have visual issues, we need to, that's why I got to be one of the first things we look at. So when you work with sports, you have a treatment team. And a lot of times with sports, we, we work with the athletic trainer, the team physicians, whether it be a general physician, an orthopedic, it could be a neurologist, it could be a physiatrist, neuropsychologist, um, therapists, OTs and PTs and speech pathologists. Sometimes you work with a dentist chiropractors, functional neurology, massage therapy, um, and really the neurooptometrist is the vision coach. I love to use that term. You know, people ask me what, what, when I work with a team, I, I'm the vision coach. Um, uh, so I, I like uh, that thought. And it's primarily optometrists that are vision coaches. There are some ophthalmologists that do it as well, but primarily optometrists. So at the beginning, I mentioned some of the organizations. I talked about the International Sports Vision Association. That's the website right there, sportsvision.pro. Make sure you click on it. Join our organization. We'd love to have you as part of it. Um, uh, also, the, if you're interested more on the brain injury and the concussion side, the Neurooptometric Rehabilitation Association um, is, is another, and that's neurovisionrehab.org. Nora's meeting is coming up, and it's going to be online. It's going to be two days of online um, um, two, two days of online courses, September 12th and 13th. Um, if you go to Nora2020.com, you can register and, and actually take the full Nora course. Uh, so it's on eye, brain, and body integration and neuro care. So it's a great course that's coming up, and I hope many of you can, can participate. And then uh, the, the sports vision course coming up in 2021 is going to be sports vision, health performance, and recovery. Uh, February 11th through 13th, 2021 in um, Kissimmee, Florida, which is near Orlando, right by Disney World. It's five minutes from Disney World. So if you want to come and take a Disney World vacation and come to a great sports vision meeting and learn a lot, come to our meeting. We'd love to have you come out. Here is my contact information, um, my cell phone, my office number. Uh, we have a Facebook. We have a Twitter um, website you're welcome to look at. Also feel free to email me. By the way, this is a, uh, a sculpture that is in, sits in the middle of downtown Dallas and uh, a little park in downtown Dallas, the big eyeball. So if you ever make it here to Dallas, you gotta go see the big eyeball. And I think with that, I am pretty well done with that part of the presentation. Um, and we can kind of go into questions. Uh, let me get my video turned back on here. There, there we are. Um, and I see there are a few questions up here. So let me kind of jump into the chat here. Um, is there a criteria on the basis of which uh, it can be decided who can play any sports games on the basis of visual acuity as in the case of giving a driver's license? Uh, thank you, uh, I, is it Ajaz Shah for that question? Um, I, obviously, I think visual acuity can play a role in certain sports and more sports than others, but I don't want to limit a sport because of visual acuity. I've actually been on the ski slopes skiing and seeing blind skiers with guides. So 
you know, I, I would never like to limit a sport based on visual acuity alone. Uh, I think there can be adaptations uh, for them to, to, uh, to, to, to perform at a higher level. In fact, one of my favorite stories when I first started working with the hockey team going back to about seven or eight seasons ago, um, I had a young athlete come in to see me who uh, was one of the best players on the team. He actually was a draft pick for the National Hockey League. Um, big guy. Um, and I found uh, he came in for a concussion, but, but basically he had a, um, uh, he ha I, I discovered he had amblyopia. And uh, so, I, and he was, uh, he was wearing only, you know, he was, he was only seeing well out of one eye. The other eye wasn't, I think he was like a plus six in one eye and Plano in the other eye. And I, I said, wow, we should really work on your amblyopia and improve it. But didn't mean he wasn't a great athlete, and he was, and he was a, and he was a top level athlete. I wish I got him as a kid, where I could have dealt with his amblyopia much better, and and we got that fixed. And I, I think we would have, uh, he, he would have gone even further. Um, so another question from you was: Is any sportsman having amaurosis fujax and the respective person is concealing effects? How can they be diagnosed? Obviously, um, once again, it goes back to asking the right questions and really getting a good a good measurement of visual acuity but um you've got you know you've got to stress to the athletes hey if you're having any symptoms any type of medical symptom you need to tell the trainer you need to tell the coach uh you need to report it and check it have it checked out because if it's going to affect your performance it's going to affect the performance if it's a team sport it's going to affect the performance of the whole team so we need to check these things out the biggest problem, more so than Amorosis Fujax, is I don't find that very often, is these guys that are playing and get bopped in the head during the game, and they and they've had a potential concussion, and they're they're staying in and playing. They just shake their head and keep going, and then they have really bad symptoms later on, or the next day, or the day after, or next week. Um, so uh, I think uh, I think you have to really ask good questions, and then you can you can do things like measurement of acuity, um, certainly looking at pupils, things of that nature. Is there a course for learning how to give sports vision therapy? Is that go thumb? Uh, yes, I, I just gave you the information for the sports vision uh, lectures that are going to be uh, given in uh, Florida. But as I said, they may be available remotely. There's also, if you go on the sportsvision.pro website, there you, there's a link on there, I believe, so you can order the, the, all the lectures from last year's uh, conference. Um, they're, they're, so they're made available by a company called Digivision and they will send you uh, a link and you, can, and you can actually watch every single course that was given at the last two conferences. So um, certainly that, you can go back and do it or you can do it hopefully live this year. Um, are you using synaptic strobe created by Brunel for the sports vision therapy? Actually, the Synaptic Strobe was not created by Brunel. Brunel is the distributor for it. Uh, it's actually kind of created by Synaptic. And there's another one called the Vima Synaptic uh, uh, Vima Strobe also that's out there. Um, but but the, the, yeah, the one by Brunel is the one we use. Uh, normal ratio or value for SBO, SBC. I'm not following what SBO, SBC is. Uh, is that, uh, I'm not sure what that is. If you can put up another question and, and kind of spread it out i can i can have a look at it and sports like archery shooting usually the player has to close one eye to get an accurate target which may lead to a lazy eye how do you overcome the problem if it arises um obviously outside of when they're doing their activity we need to make sure they're doing good binocular skills that's how you do it if they're doing binocular skills and they're developing good binocular skills um outside of their their, their craft when they go to it they're going to have that you're going to be able to shoot and cover an eye and actually still be able to maintain good visual acuity. Can we be able to give synaptic strobe as amblyopia therapy if amb in amblyopic patients? There are some strobe therapies available for amblyopic patients. I haven't done that. Um, uh, and I think there, there's some pros and cons to it. Um, uh, so I, I, I don't know if I would do it with the synaptic strobes. I think there's some specific strobes that are made for amblyopia therapy. Is visual spatial neglect and TBI similar to peripheral field loss? All right, great question. Uh, thank you, Rinkoff, uh, for, for asking that question. You can have a visual field loss, or you can have a spatial inattention, or you can have both one on top of the other, okay? 
So that's for a TBI course, but that's a quick glance at it. So you can have a person who's had, um, who has a, a unawareness of their left side of their visual world, uh, but doesn't have a visual field loss. And usually that comes back pretty quickly. But you can also have a person who has a, a definitive visual field loss due to, a, let's say, a, um, a stroke. Uh, uh, you have a stroke on the left occipital lobe, you're going to have a right sided visual field loss. But you can have the one who has the, the stroke on the right occipital lobe, but also affects, goes into the uh, posterior parietal lobe. And the posterior parietal lobe controls that visual attention. And so if it, if it goes over that whole area, you can have a, um, once again, you can have a visual field loss and, a, and an inattention one on top of the other. Unfortunately, in those cases, the outcome is usually not nearly as good. Uh, here I ask uh, the sports like judo, karate, taekwondo, pro wrestling, boxing are also famous here in Nepal. Can you highlight which of these visual skills are important for these? Obviously for, for, for fighting sports like judo, karate, taekwondo, peripheral awareness is really, really important. Tracking is really important. Uh, I guess pro wrestling and boxing. So all the, you, you like all the fighting sports, it looks like. Um, so yeah, peripheral awareness, um, speed of recognition, type of activities like tachistoscopic activities, um, uh, visual speed. Those are all really important activities for, for, for the fighting sports, as I like to call them. Okay. I think, is that all the questions I have? Let me just double check and make sure I have nothing else that's come through here. Um, let's see here. It looks like I got all the questions. Um, so um, thank you so much for having me. I hope you, everyone learned a lot. SBO standing on one leg, both eyes open and standing both, standing one leg with both eyes closed. Okay, so thanks for um, uh, clearing that up. Um, is there a normal value? No, there's not a no, I don't think there's a normative value for that, but I think you have to compare those situations to each other. Does that make sense? Um, obviously you're, with both eyes closed, you're gonna expect more sway, more movement um, than you are gonna be with both eyes open. But if it's the opposite, if you see more sway with both eyes open, that tells me the visual system is not very efficient. And there's something going on in the visual system that's throwing off balance. So when I see with the eyes open, them swaying more, I know there's a visual, big time visual issue going on that needs to be addressed. Anything else? Yeah, can you check another question on the chat box, doctor? Uh, let's see, I'm gonna see if there's anything. Oh, can ISFA help us in advocacy with the government here in Nepal to help to make the vision examination compulsory to the national athletes? Well, to be honest with you, it's not compulsory here in the U.S. for, for, for national athletes either. Um, so I don't know. I don't know if we've had any success in doing that. Governments do what governments do, uh, unfortunately. Um, but certainly we want to make the awareness better. And the good way to do that, what we've done with the International Sports Vision Association that we've done really, really well, is we put a lot of stuff out on social media, uh, the internet, things like that. And we, we, we have all sorts of articles. And we, what we say is, when you, when you see an article, you, you post it up on your, on, your, on your social media and you get the word out. Because if you get the word out, people will notice. So to me, social media is a great tool to get the word out. And then once you once you gain some momentum, then you could probably go in uh, to to your government and say, "Hey, look, look at all these articles we've been putting up, and people are showing an interest. We really need to make this compulsory for the athlete." But I think it's a process. I don't think we can just do it overnight. Uh, yes, doctor. I guess you missed the one question just about this uh, this question, last question one. Uh, it's for agassi. Uh, is visual, so I got that one, I got, I think I got it. Let me just see, oh, let me see if, that, if there's anything else that's popped up here since I last looked. Um, the, the, actually, I covered the ISFA advocacy, I, I covered the standing on one leg, I talked about judo, visual spatial, um, synaptic therapy. Um, I think I got all of them. I think I got all the questions. 
Oh, okay, here's so... a new one. Hey, it just came up. It just came up. Hang on. Uh, what do you suggest for an optometrist who wishing to add sports vision to their practice? The first thing I'll tell you to do is get as much education as you can. Um, no, no pun intended, but don't go in there blindly. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, go, go, uh, you know, I think it's really important to learn as much as you can have, get a good sense and then you can really start um, going out there and, 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 and really helping people um, improve their vision skills. Thanks a lot, doctor. I mean, the, I love, love, love the word you use as vision coach. I'm going to use it a lot more henceforth. Yeah, I, I became a big fan of that one also. So I, I, feel okay. free to use it. Steal anything I, I said today. <laughs> Even in India, I mean, if somebody asks me, what is it that you, you do, you do, I take a minute to, you know, to kind of think, what could I tell them so that they can, you know, relate to what I do. So, yes, right. this is, yeah, one thing which it's I just, use it. It's just a very simple, easy way to explain it. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Stiles, for such a wonderful session. It was truly You're my with... pleasure. I, I loved it. Hopefully I can come back and talk to you some on some other subjects as well. <laughs> Thank okay. you so much, Doctor. It's our immense pleasure to have you with us and we would love to see you again in the future. Everyone take care and enjoy your rest of your evening. Yes, Doctor. Uh, just Doctor, I want to highlight the one question and this is also asked by the audience. So, like the young generation who want to be uh, involved in the history, like uh, whom they are basically follow or what they study natural to use that is follow. I'm sorry, you're kind of breaking up there. I didn't get a good okay, doctor. I didn't hear the okay, okay, doctor. I'm, I'm going to repeat it once again. So, doctor, like the youth who want to involve themselves on the uh, sport season and if they want to learn more about it, so would you refer any type of books at the moment or any website or anything? There, there, to be a a couple, idea. There, there are a couple of good books out there. Um, you know, you can certainly look them up on something like, uh, you know, one of the websites for that have uh, books. Um, Don Teague's written a really good book on sports vision. There's been a bunch of books on sports vision. Um, uh, there's a, another group called Sports Vision Pros. Um, and uh, th that's out there that has some online courses as well. So you can definitely check out Sports Vision Pros. Um, every year, the American Optometric Association also puts on some sports vision courses and coursework. So there's lots of different ways to do it. But probably the most, the, the most comprehensive coursework uh, you're going to find is the, the International Sports Vision Association. Okay. So, Doctor, my last question is, if we want to start the, doing the uh, sport, uh, sport vision, so how would you suggest to, uh, to do in our pri private clinic? Uh, well, I think the first thing, the best thing to do is start with um, some athletes, just your regular patients that you work with that, are, that do athletics. That's the best place to start. So you have that person who's a tennis player and uh, he comes into your office and he, want, and he wants to enhance his vision skills in tennis. He wants to become a, he wants to move up the ladder in, in, in the tennis world. Or you have the soccer player who, a youth soccer player who wants to, to, to elevate his level up. Um, that's the player you talk to. Hey, look, we offer something called sports vision, which you can enhance your vision skills for sports. So that's, uh, I would start with your own patient base and build it from there to get to the professional level of sports is more challenging. It's really important to start off with your, your, your youth players. I think, uh, I started off with little league baseball. That's how I got started. So it's really good to start at that level, hone your skills, get really good. And then you can really go to university levels or to um to professional levels okay doctor thank you so much once again for such a wonderful presentation it's a totally new insight for us and basically for the asian people so uh so would you like to add a few words before the wrap up our session Oh, I, once again, just I want to thank everyone. I really enjoyed speaking to your group. Spreading the good word of sports vision around the world is, is my goal. Um, so which is why we started the International Sports Vision Association is really to spread the good word. We're doing a lot of good work 
Um, and we need to educate doctors all over, uh, doctors and optometrists all over the world on how to do this. So thank you for taking part. If you have any questions and you want to email me, feel free to email me. Um, I, I'm usually pretty good about getting back to you pretty quickly. Um, and once again, thank you so much. Thank you so much, doctor. Have a good day. Will do.